So welcome everyone, welcome to the uh, Blender Conference 2022. And, and we are celebrating that 20 years ago, here in Amsterdam, Blender became open source. So happy birthday to Blender. And I want to start uh, the presentation with good news. Because I'm still there! <laughs> so this talk is not going to end with a uh, sad ending or whatever. Uh, the doctors uh, declared me fully clean. I don't have to worry. And I'm as healthy as an old man like me can be. So <laughs> don't worry. No worries. Now, for my story, I do want to take you back three years, because that was the, the previous Blender conference. <clears throat> and at the Blender conference, I was uh, making a funny joke to say, ah, I'm going to resign from my duties in Blender in five years, right? And that was a little bit challenging fate, because it wasn't four months later, or oh, I was in hospital, balancing on the edge of uh, life and death. Luckily, my own prospects quickly went better, but then, you know what happened? I got out of the hospital and the world was empty, right? It was like being in a zombie movie, being the only survival. So I think people uh, probably remember this famous cartoon. Right? So we all thought, ah, this whole COVID thing it will go away, it's a little thing, right? But it was quite a big thing. And it's almost three years later, it's still a thing. Luckily, right, it's going away, that's why we can do this event. And I think everybody was like, yeah, finally we can do things again. Were it not that somebody <laughs> in the Kremlin decided to invade an innocent country and uh, play war games with uh, everyone. So that's a big threat. But What's happening after that? Huh? We got an energy crisis. All know this, and this is going to be a big thing for the coming years. And we didn't forget about our good old friend, right? climate change. So this is the biggest threat for mankind that will cause a massive biodiversity collapse. <laughs> so all doom and gloom, right? But I can tell you, there's even one more thing worse for mankind. <laughs> The metaverse, right? We all know the hype, and on one hand, you could see it as this horrible nightmare, right? What we know from the Matrix movies, uh, where people will be connected with neural links directly to the internet, and the big corporations are going to control our bodies and our thoughts and everything, so that we make sure that we are fully absorbed in some kind of universe that uh, doesn't really exist. So that's the nightmare version, probably the wet dream of Mark Zuckerberg and other friends. But I hope this is not going to happen. And the other more neutral way to look at it is that uh, this is the new next internet. Uh, the internet will become 3D or more 3D, and we probably will start browsing and experiencing the internet with uh, 3D engines. So that's a great technology challenge. And you can see that the whole industry is jumping on it. And they're all, of course, promising that they will make it open, right? it's open source and open standards. And if you look, all those companies who are promising to make sure that there will be public standards, it will all be open and friendly and accessible for everyone. So then I think, so where are the people here, right? I was um, last summer at SIGGRAPH in Vancouver, and there were events about the metaverse, and you saw those big corporations making big stories about what they are going to do. And one of the organizers, I met him afterwards, I asked him, why wasn't Blender invited, right? Why were we not there? 
And he said, oh my God, oh yeah, uh, we forgot probably. And I said, well, <coughs> even when you would have invited me, I would have declined. I don't think I belong there. Uh, Blender is still super small, and I don't think I can make any difference there, right? All of those companies, the corporations, they're all working with billions of dollars of budgets. Uh, they are developing things and de making a pie and slicing it up and making sure that everybody can make a lot of money. That's not where I can contribute things to. But there is an issue that we have to tackle, because who do you really trust to make the next internet? But is that Meta? Is it Google or Amazon? Or is it Apple? Or do we trust uh, Elon Musk to do all of this? So there's a lot of people lost trust in big corporations to be able to act in the best interest of people. So now, if there would be one organization that has this massive community of creative people who do 3D and who have no shareholders and no ownership and they have no money-making uh, aspirations, who would that be? So that's huh, the thing I think we should step in as Blender. And I would like to announce a new initiative which is called the, the Blender Lab, which is a group of people who will be working on the future of Blender. So something that only has to work in like five years. I want to have five or ten of the best brains that we can find to see the future. And we have to make sure that we have things like AR and VR technology, that we uh, can do networking, that we connect people, that we know how to share and how to collaborate online. <coughs> and not only that, because something is looming behind the metaphors, right? <laughs> and what do you think? Ah, the AIs, the evil AIs. I mean, in SIGGRAPH there were speakers claiming that the AIs are going to make the metaverse. Right? Really, for real, they believe that they're training it. You know that AIs are being trained to use Blender geometry nodes, right? Can you b even imagine where that's going if the AIs start using Blender? I don't want to know, right? It's, uh, but it is a thing, so what we have to make sure as Blender community within our mission and uh, the Blender philosophy, we have to make sure that AIs are going to be the tools that work for us, uh, for the artists, and that we have control over this, that we have access to it, that is all free and openly available. <coughs> I even think that I have an idea for how to make the metaphors. And many people don't know yet, but I think I know. And the way how to make it is by not wanting to make it, right? And just do nice things for people. <laughs> and the nice things, it means, of course, you have the tools, but you should be able to connect to the, the web, and you should be able to share your work, you should be able to collaborate, and you should be able to have a fair living, uh, access to the markets, to make sure that you as an artist are in control of your life. Go back two years ago, I was uh, out of hospital, we were still in lockdowns, so I had a lot of time to think, and I wanted to make sure that what I feel is my legacy, and the ideas I have, that these are being absorbed and, and transported to more people. So what is it what I find important for Blender that I want other people to understand? And that was uh, why the slogan started, uh, the freedom to create. Uh, for me, it means a lot, uh, especially because it goes back to the three core freedoms that you can define. Uh, of course, the first one is open source, uh, the freedom to deploy production, open so uh, production software the core principle of the free software movement, that you have access to the sources and that you can make new versions. It also means that you should have access to apply creative resources. It's not only assets, but also production knowledge. Because with only the software, it doesn't mean that you can make things. You have to make sure that you know how to make things and that you have the libraries and the data available to do that. And the third thing I want to work on is the access to markets. People should be able to uh, have uh, access to 
um, selling films or games or artwork and should not be locked up in platforms or systems where they are being uh, restricted. So access to market is one of the things we are working on and we are going to announce, maybe it has been announced because yesterday I wasn't uh, much online to see it, is what we call the Blender apps. So what is Blender apps? Well, it's not something really new, but we call it something new. Because simply said, it's just the wrapping up of the Blender 2.8 project. Uh, in Blender 2.8, we try to make sure that Python is controlling the UI and the way how Blender is working. And by finishing that completely, you can actually make blend files with some configuration sets around it and create your own complete new application. For example, the Monkey Blender, right? And the only thing the thing will do is to uh, drag and drop items and colors. But a Blender app can be a video player or a reviewing tool or a little tool for 3D printing companies to uh, test if a model is working. Uh, it can be experiences that you want to share with other people. You put it online, you share it. Uh, you can give it to clients because clients want to have 3D visualizations of their buildings or products on trade shows or in presentations. All of that is going to be possible with Blender with a single export and so a lot of scripting around it, maybe. And then you make an application that is fully Blender compatible. More information you will be able to find on the, uh, the code block soon. <coughs> I've also been uh, rethinking the role of the Blender Studio because most people might not know, but we have a Blender Institute and a Blender Studio in the same building at the Blender headquarters. And I really love it that we have the creative people and the technical people working together on challenging each other. And within the studio, we had still a project to make a big film, a big feature film, and work with the industry, Hollywood, on getting it funded. But at that time, I thought, uh, maybe you can still make money or fund the Blender project by doing commercial work uh, for the film. Maybe use an open source pipeline and then make a film for the market. This didn't really happen. And also, it wasn't really needed because Blender, since 2019, took off like magically. We have the whole industry coming on board already. So the feature film became more of a burden. So I decided that we uh, found a production company who took over the rights. And they are now further developing it. And they might be looking for Blender Studios uh, who will do it. We might support them a little bit, but we're not going to make it ourselves. <coughs> so in the past year, we also worked on Sprite Fright, an amazing short film. It was the biggest project we ever did, and we were also trying to make a production pipeline for things. Also, that made me thinking a bit. But the thing that was most affecting me last year was the, the demise of uh, Tencent Animation. That's this big studio, three, four hundred people all working on Blender. They delivered a fantastic TV series. And basically, the day they were ready, Netflix pulled the plug and said, well, great job, right? And let's move on. So you see that Hollywood and the big industry, they are more and more treating artists as disposable material. It's not something I really like, right? I also don't like it that they say, yeah, Blender is not ready for us because we need things to fit in pipelines, right? Well, this is pipelines, right? This is how pipelines work. Pipelines means it's industrial. It means we divide the task in all kinds of small items in a way that you can scale it up. You don't make a pipeline for artists yeah, to give them creative control or to make them uh, become happier or more productive. You make them for the people who pay the bills to make sure that you can efficiently as possible write in 50 animators, put them to work for a year, and then uh, fire all of them so that you have a movie. <coughs> working on those pipelines is also always working for the past, it's never working for the future. So the Blender mission, one of the things we always said is what we want to do is to enable individuals and small teams to create world-class stunning computer graphics and art and movies and games. And that's what the focus is again for the studio. Uh, the studio is small, eight to 10 people. 
and we are going to keep working and empowering them to make amazing and big things. And then they will build and share all of the knowledge for how to make things. One of the things you can see tonight is a sneak peek of the latest short film they are working on in EV. <coughs> Positized. <coughs> so, I have a little message. <laughs> so, dear, dear Hollywood, right? Man, I love you, right? You are fantastic, and uh, you've always been uh, the greatest inspiration for me for things. And I think we also share the passion for, for 3D and for, uh, for the whole medium that we are working on. And it's even that the mission statement for Blender, you could say, is get the best 3D technology in the hands of artists that open source and make amazing things with it, right? That's exactly what you guys also do in Hollywood, except for the open source part, of course. So I love to work with you, right? You are welcome to contribute to our mission. But what I don't want is to work for you, right? Because be honest, right? If you look at the whole market, uh, the whole the computer graphics users in the world, uh, you are the tiny little top in the pyramid, and you are amazing. You have the best people, the best technology. You have billions of dollars to, to spend on things. But really, are you waiting for me, right? Are you waiting for us here to help you or to rescue you? I don't think so. It's not even needed because, uh, hello, Autodesk, uh, Foundry, uh, Adobe, uh, that's where your market is. So if you help uh, the 30, 40,000 people in Hollywood, then we, Blender, can take care of the rest. It's a good deal. So I'd like to end with the first freedom, that is of the, the core of open source. Uh, every year I hammer on this. What does it mean, right? What does it mean to have open source free software? And that you have access to the code that you can make changes and share it with others. Key freedoms of how Blender is built. Whether you agree on it or not, it's just the agreement of why we are together. And for add-ons, it's the same, right? It's the same thing. It's part of Blender. Uh, we designed the API for Blender to be an extensible thing. So what we, if you extend Blender with functionality, you basically are using Blender functionality. But they have to be GPL2. And I found out in the past years that this got a little bit muddy and murky, right? If people say, yeah, if something doesn't work in Blender, you have to buy an add-on. Right? I don't like that, right? I know the uh, commercial add-on people are great, and they deserve every freedom to sell their products, but we also should take the responsibility as Blender project to say, yes, but we also have our own platform, uh, similar to Mozilla, for example, has an add-ons uh, extension group. So we will work with the community and with uh, some staff from the Blender Institute to manage an extensions platform where pre-approved high-quality add-ons are available for everyone. And we will work together with the Blender market and other platforms to make sure that there is no conflict, or that we have a nice uh, balanced situation between what the commercial world and what's the, the free software world. So you can check on uh, code.blender.org to uh, read more about this. <coughs> and that's it. Right.